We're going to get started. Um, this is Dr. Sherpar. You're going to be working with him this year. I'm sure a lot of you have already met him. Uh, but he'll be teaching EMGs this year, and he's the expert. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> I know a couple more things than you, that's all. That's <laughs> not an expert, by any means, by any chance, all right? Um, electrodiagnosis, in a sense, is an amalgamation of a lot of different pieces of knowledge. I think that's one of the first things you gotta you will learn. Uh, you need to put together your basic knowledge in anatomy and physiology, neurophysiology, along with things with disease processes. And then, you know, once you put that knowledge piece apart, then you have to get your hands better in terms of finding, doing appropriate studies, doing it right, well, uh, and then have a knowledge of the disease processes and put it all together along with clinical examination and uh, history. So it is actually a mosaic of different things which you're going to be doing. And it's a good segue into probably thinking about doing physical medicine, uh, learning to examine peripheral nervous system and musculoskeletal system as well. So um, with that, let's go into looking what an electrodiagnostic consultation is, right? So it's very similar to medical consultation, right? So you have, you know, focused neuromusculoskeletal history and physical exam. You develop a differential diagnosis based on that. So patient comes to you, tells you he's got, you know, pain in the neck, uh, and it goes down to the arm, what do you think? What's your differential diagnosis for that? Radiculopathy could be um, something central, like in the actual spinal cord. Okay. Um, could be referred musculoskeletal pain. Okay. Referred musculoskeletal pain from where? From the, uh, from the heart, heart and lungs. Just pain down to the left. Okay, you're thinking heart, okay. All right, so it's coming from the neck, but he said neck and down to the hand. So, what else do you think? Trigger points. Trigger points. Trigger points. So, the differential diagnosis is expensive. However, it could be also that somebody could have something like carpal tunnel syndrome, but still could have similar kind of thing. There could be an online entrapment without it, could still have things. So, just that doesn't mean that it is a root reason. So you need to think through the process and examine and kind of put things together. So, key thing. Next thing is using appropriate muscles and nerves, doing EMG nerve conduction study, and you formulate a final diagnosis and develop suggestions for management of the pathology and future workup. So, it's just like a medical consultation, right? But the thing is, though, you have to acquire a lot of this information because what you're used to doing is, in an inpatient setting, you have a lot of the things. You have the history, you have the physical exam, you're going to cheat off of a lot of things. You don't have a chance of that. These are all outpatients. And majority of the time, when I look at the history and physical exam from inpatient, it is not useful for me. It generally is useless. So, because clinically it's not well done for a good musculoskeletal, neuromusculoskeletal examination. So, you will have to really get that information again together to see what's happening. So, it's an extension of physical examination and it quantitates nerve and muscle injury, right? So, why it's useful data regarding nerve injury it tells you where the pathology is, the site. The type of injury is it an axon loss injury, demal injury, 
uh, neuroplastic block? Uh, is it a muscle problem? Is it uh, in the angiohorn cell, uh, root, plexus, whatever? And then it tells you about the severity. Is it mild, moderate, severe? How long it's been there? Is it acute? Is it chronic? And it will tell you about prognosis based on the other pieces of information. Is this patient going to get better? The patient is not going to get better. Uh, if it's going to get better, how much of it may get better? So it's an important pieces of information you're going to acquire off of the EMG, right? So let's look at what you do with motor conduction studies. What are the parameters you're going to get in motor conduction studies? When you stimulate a peripheral nerve and record from the muscle, it's going to take some certain amount of time for the nerve to transmit the impulse to the muscle. And I'll show you a recording, and it will sh show you the time that's called distal latency. When you stimulate in a distal part of the nerve, record from the muscle, it's called distal latency. Whenever we talk about latency, it's almost always about distal latency, not necessarily proximal latency, basically because when you are looking at a distal latency, you have a fixed distance between the nerve and the muscle belly. So that way you can compare your value to my value to you know somebody who is six foot six and somebody who is three foot six. Because it's a fixed distance. If you don't have a fixed distance, you cannot really compare the values very well. The question somebody was asking me just now using anatomic landmarks and doing it. Say if you have this crease and go two, two centimeters above it or doing it at wrist crease, would not be able to be that well compared basically because your distances are gonna be different, right? So one could be 10 centimeters, one could be six centimeters and time which takes for the nerve to transmit impulses are gonna be different. So that's a good, Point to think about. Um, so it's written by the conduction velocity of the nerve itself, a neuromuscular junction delay, and the muscle. The amplitude is determined by the number of muscle fibers which are activated, right? So you have uh, a, a large muscle, and with a lot of fibers, a lot of axons, you're going to have a larger amplitude. Say when you look at uh, a very small muscle, you may have less of an amplitude, but the density of the muscle fibers also is going to make a difference under your electrode. Okay, and you now proximal conduction velocity is between two points. So you stimulate at the elbow and at the wrist, and you have a distance between the two sides, and then you have two latencies: one for distal, one for proximal. And the difference of the time between the two and the distance can give you the conduction velocity. And it means it's determined by the fastest axons conducting between the two points, right? So we said that we get the distance between proximal and distal latencies, uh, distal cathodes in millimeters. So if this is 25 centimeters, that's 250 millimeters. <laughs> and the proximal latency was 10, and distal latency was 5. The difference between the two is 5. And the conduction velocity would be what? So 5 would be in milliseconds. It would be 50 milliseconds. I mean, 5 milliseconds. And, and, then, um, and then the distance in um, millimeters was 250. The conduction velocity would be 50 meters per second because it is in the same um, uh, category. One is thousandth of a meter, the other one is thousandth of a second. So you can convert it to meters per second. If it is in centimeters, then it would not be, because the one would be a hundredth of a meter and the other would be a thousandth of a second, right? So you gotta convert it into same, uh, same parameter to be able to get meter per second. So that's why you, calculate the distance in millimeter, and then your latencies are already in milliseconds, and then you would get a conduction velocity. 
So this is uh, one of the things which we did here, right? So here is the distal point of stimulation at the rest, and then a proximal point of stimulation of the median nerve here. And then you are recording from the abductor pollicis brevis, the thin arm muscle right there. So that gives you two values. You get one value for here, and one value from stimulating at the elbow all the way to the uh, thin arm muscle. Right? And here is your responses. The responses from the wrist, elbow, and axilla. And note that there is an interesting factor there. All three responses look exactly the same. That's how it should be, because you're recording from the same muscle, same nerve. And if the responses look different, what would be the problem? Justin, what do you think if the responses are different? What would you think the problem would be? You could be stimulating the wrong side. Anything else would you think if you're stimulating? Could be an entrapment. An entrapment. Stimulating more than one nerve, that's the commonest problem people would have. That means you're stimulating too much of a nerve. So what you're doing is you're stimulating at the elbow, you're stimulating median and ulnar nerve together, shape changes. Or you stimulate at the herbs point or supraclavicular area, you're stimulating 10 different nerves. And so you things change again a whole bunch more. So you're so that, that is one of the commonest causes of change of the shape. So you will have to be very careful about trying to get similar shape and size. Size may be a little bit different. As you notice, as you go proximally, the amplitude gets a little bit smaller sometimes. That's because of phase cancellation. That is, your negative phase and positive phase cancel out as you go proximally, and so your amplitude becomes a little bit small, which is, actually a, a phenomenon which happens based on the distance. So if you go 20 centimeters proximally, if you drop one uh, millivolt, if you go 10 centimeters more than that, it should drop only by 0.5 millivolts, if it, if it is due to phase cancellation. But it could be pathological, like somebody was mentioning, and if it's pathological, then it would be a whole bunch more of dropout in the, in the size. So, when you're looking at sensory conduction, you're looking at, again, onset latency and peak latency. Because the reason why I mentioned both of them is this. A lot of people, by convention, started looking at peak latencies because the initial machines 40, 30, 40, 50 years ago had very poor resolution. So they could not really see a good onset point. So they could see a bump. So they said, well, the peak is the best thing to look at because these are very small responses. Remember, your motor responses are in millivolts. Millivolts uh, is, is much larger than microvolts. The sensories are in microvolts. The motor responses are in millivolts. It's 100 times different. So the responses are so small, so they started looking at peak latencies. And that has continued today. However, if you want to calculate a conduction velocity to the peak point, you really are not getting the fastest fibers. So you're looking at some mid-range fibers which are coming in, and you're calculating a conduction velocity. So you cannot calculate a conduction velocity. There you can only look at a latency. So, Again, the conduction velocity is by the fastest fibers, and that has to be by the onset latency. And amplitude is determined by the number of large diameter sens sensory fibers activated. It does not show you the small fibers. Small fibers are going to be very slow, and that does not contribute to the amplitude of the response. Okay? It's going to be much later, which comes in, and you have to look at a very 
high gain and average the response to be able to see those small sensory fibers. So the sensory conduction velocity, that's how we are going to calculate. We look at the distance between the cathode. Cathode is the distal point of stimulation. And the active electrode, which is the recording electrode, is the first electrode. And that distance in millimeter is divided by the distal latency in milliseconds, which will give you the conduction velocity. And if you look at the recording, again, you have your recording from the finger here. So you see the ring, ring electrodes on the finger, and you're stimulating in two points here. You're stimulating at the palm, and then you're stimulating at the wrist. A lot of the times you don't do the palm stimulation. A lot of the times you just do the wrist stimulation. But you could do palm stimulation, and you can get responses like that. <clears throat> and this one has three stimulation points, the palm, the wrist, and the elbow. And you see what happens. This is a lot more classic of sensory responses compared to motor responses. Motor responses dropped only a little bit in amplitude. But look at the amount of drop of amplitude you would have in the sensory responses because what would happen as you go proximally with sensory fibers is you have less density of fibers together. So you are going to have a significant phase cancellation. And then as you go far, farther up, the response became a little bit wider. As you look at this here, this response is wider compared to this. So the area under the curve may be similar or close to it, but really the amplitude drops off from here to here for, from 70 to you know, 31. Right? The proximal amplitude up here, or the distal amplitude is uh, 70. And as you go proximally, it went down to 31. The same amount of stimulus is being used. Uh, and the response is supramaximal. You always look at the amplitudes at the supramaximal stimulation. Supramaximal is the point when the amplitude stops growing. Okay. And beyond that, you go about 5% or so. And then it doesn't change. That's what's called supramaximal. Okay, so you're always going to use supermaximum stimulation to get that response. And the conduction velocities generally are a little bit faster in the sensory fibers because they are a little bit larger fibers than the motor fibers. So here is the limitations of nerve conduction study. Uh, okay. The application of nerve conduction studies you know, quantify the peripheral nervous system function, right? And you can standardize methods and values between the laboratories, so you can compare between populations uh, the, uh, the values. And within your own lab, if you have a subject who you are following, because you are using standardized values, standardized technique, you can look at whether they're improving, worsening, you can compare the values. You end up doing that a lot of the time. And of course, you can characterize the disorders of the peripheral nervous system. So you can, we talked about localization, distribution. So it could be a focal, multifocal, diffuse, motor, or sensory. You know, it could be just carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a very focal pathology. Right? If it is a multifocal pathology, you could have something like mononeuropathy multiplex where you could have a patch of abnormality in one area and another area has another patch of abnormality which is a multifocal pathology or such as guillain barre syndrome where you could have different areas of within the same nerve which would have problem you know neuropraxis blocks and demyelination and that kind of thing could be generalized diffuse like a diabetic peripheral neuropathy where you could have you know, all limbs involved. It could be pure motor neuropathies or pure sensory neuropathies. If you look at the severity, time course, uh, again, talk about alcohol and demon, I think, 
And then we can look at neuromuscular junction problem with nerve conduction studies, right? Because you can do repetitive stimulation study and look at the decremental responses. So those are going to be a useful kind of thing. So, so what are the limitations? So nerve conduction study cannot pick up small fiber pathology. Those do not represent, in fact, EMG studies in itself will not be able to pick up pathologies of small fibers. We are kind of uh, biased towards large uh, axons only. Now, no connection study cannot tell you whether it's a radiculopathy or not. You have to go to EMGs to look at that. Same thing with uh, motor neuron disease or early myopathies and stuff like that. You know, you may have in severe or a late motor neuron disease or myopathy, you may have decrease in amplitude, but it doesn't tell you that that is the pathology. However, what it tells you is that there is some pathology, and then you have to go back and look at what the pathology may be, looking at different uh, studies. So, say if it's somebody who has got conduction block versus early axon block, uh, you can't really differentiate between those two. So, somebody comes to you day one, the nerve is cut completely. Or the same person who may have a physiologic block. The nerve is in continuity, but there is complete block. When you stimulate the nerve distal to the area of injury, it would still be producing the same kind of response, day one. Okay, neuropractic block, would be doing the same thing in, in a nerve uh, neurotomitic lesion, which is nervous cut, you're going to have the same kind of response. But when you go proximal to the area of stimulation, <coughs> you are not going to have a response, right? So you cannot differentiate early on between one and the other. It will take a little bit of time when valerian degeneration is complete or where the response starts becoming smaller, and that would give you a pieces of information about conduction block versus axon block. So, um, it can tell you about distal conduction block versus axon block. So, where would you see that? So, if you see a person who has got gender A, where there could be conduction block in those distal axons, distal motor axons, and then you stimulate, you are not going to get a response. But then we wouldn't know in those people whether that is really due to an axon loss lesion or due to conduction block. And when you go stick a needle three, four weeks down the line, they may not have any abnormalities of axon loss. Acute axon loss, you will see fibrillations, positive waste, we'll talk about that in a bit. But you won't see that. And they're thinking, why is this? This amplitude is small. We know it's only two, three weeks, and they should have been some abnormalities. We don't see the abnormality. And we know based on that that you could say, yeah, this could be possibly related to distal axon block, uh, distal conduction block. So uh, you, can, you can differentiate early on with that. Um, and if it's a mixed axon loss demyelinating lesion, it's going to be difficult to do. So the amplitudes come down. Amplitudes could be smaller, both in demyelination, because of uh, segmental demyelination, whereas you go proximally, the amplitude is going to be smaller. And then if there is axon loss as well, that would decrease the amplitude as well at the same time. So it's going to be having some difficulties. Um, you can't really figure out the site of neuromuscular deficit as well early on. Or, or with uh, just uh, regular stimulation studies. If you do exactly the same way, both in uh, myasthenia gravis and myasthenic syndrome, one is, you know, is related to a presynaptic pathology, one is related to postsynaptic pathology, right? And in, uh, in uh, myasthenic syndrome, the problem is related to release of calcium to the uh, peripheral muscle, and in myasthenia gravis, it is related to release of the acetylcholine and its effect 
on the neuromuscular junction. Or, so it's not going to be activating the muscle fiber. So the, those differences you can pick up if you do just, you know, sleeper stimulation or uh, fiber stimulation, it will look exactly the same. However, if you change the technical aspects of it, you might be able to get information because in myasthenic syndrome, you're going to have a huge amount of increase in amplitude if you stimulate faster or if you give a short amount of uh, uh, exercise, the amplitude changes. I'll show you a, a recording of that. And in, um, in myasthenic syndrome, there's going to be a decrement of muscle fiber. So there's going to be a little bit of a difference in there. And muscle disease, again, you know, you're going to have early on, you may not have ability. And then you are going to have difficulty in differentiating between axon loss and muscle disease because they behave exactly the same. If you have, remember what we talked about, the amplitude. In the amplitude, there is the representation of the number of muscle fibers. If you have axon loss, you have less number of muscle fibers available for producing an amplitude. If you have muscle disease, it will exactly be the same because you have less number of muscle fibers due to a different pathology, but they will behave exactly the same way. So you can definitely say based on just nerve conduction, whether this is an axon loss lesion or whether it's due to muscle disease process or neuromuscular junction. So, we just already talked about some of these things, right? Um, amplitude reflects number of intact muscle fibers and nerve fibers. It's abnormal in axon loss, anti-hansel loss, muscle fiber loss, so a lot of things could cause that. It's abnormal in neuropractic block with proximal stimulation. There is the increased BMI may cause problem with amplitude. If you have a 600 pounder, there's a lot of subcutaneous tissue between your generator, which is the muscle, and your recording electrode, you're going to have smaller responses, right? And always, this is the thing which you'll have to remember. If there is loss of amplitude, true loss of amplitude, that is always associated with loss of function, okay? It's a very good point to remember. If you have decreased amplitude, in a patient who has got five or five muscle strength, that means the problem is not the patient, it's you. Okay, very important to remember because if you have, it could be related to the fact that you have stuck your active uh, recording electrode in a different place, which you have not put in the right place. So amplitude is going to be small. We had that the other day. Right? When you're stimulating, you had it in the ground like in the EMG port, uh, not in the black, on the active uh, port. So your amplitude was instead of 10 millivolts, was one millivolt. And you start looking at it and you haven't looked at that. So why is it, as I'm stimulating, it's not increasing in amplitude? The patient has normal strength. So you go back, look at the machine, there's a problem. Or you may be stimulating in the wrong area. You may be not on the right point of recording. All of that will change uh, uh, the, the amplitude. So you have to be very careful. So latency and conduction velocity reflects conduction time, again. It's abnormal in loss of myelin. Right? If there's myelin gone, your conduction velocity is going to be slow. Height and age may affect the data. So if you are tall, conduction velocity is going to be slow. Okay, uh, generally because there is tapering effect of the axon as you go away from the anterior cell. So farther away from your anterior cell, you're going to have slower conduction velocity because of the size of the axon itself. And then, the, the, then there is other thing which may happen, which is of course you are going to maintain is, you know, taller person you may have generally a little bit cooler limb as well. Uh, so you have to be aware of that. As you get older, conduction velocity is going to be slower. In young kids also it's slow, right? So if you are till about the age four, the conduction velocity is going to continue to increase. Newborn, conduction velocity is almost 50% of the norm. 
okay? because they are not myelinated yet with their nerves. So latency and conduction velocity, say if there is only abnormality of uh, conduction velocity with no change in amplitude, it does not affect the stress. So the more useful thing always to think about is the amplitude, not as much conduction velocity. It's an epiphenomenon, that's all. It really is not what affects the function. Amplitude effect function, not the conduction velocity generally. Um, so, how do we know it's normal or abnormal? So, you, you have a patient, and my normal value for my amplitude is 5 millivolts or 4 millivolts, is 5 millivolts. No, no, it's normal or abnormal. We don't have normative data for somebody, and then, you know, it could be normal for him or abnormal for him. It's completely opposite side. So if you have a normal side, and if that is 10, this is 5, you know it's 50% loss. But that person normal is 10, not necessarily before this is lab normal. Right? Remember, in a, in a curve, okay, you have mean, and you take two standard deviations, which tells only 95% of the amplitudes, but 95% of the latencies, whatever. So somebody could be outside those norms, still be normal too. What is normal for that person is important. Think about that, okay? Um, when there is aggregate loss, there is going to be some slowing not whole bunch because of loss of the fastest sometimes you could have lost the fastest conducting fibers only the mid-range fibers may be intact so that would slow the conduction velocity a little bit right amplitude loss is due to axon and muscle fiber loss but does not affect the duration of the response okay the duration if it is if the amplitude loss is due to purely axon loss of muscle fiber loss, the duration of the response is going to be exactly the same. It doesn't change. If it is demyelination on the other hand, the duration is going to change significantly. Neuromuscular junction block could cause loss of amplitude because you have less number of muscle fibers which are being activated. So conduction velocity is slow with acquired or hereditary demyelination, right? Amplitude may be small due to segmental demyelination or due to neuropraxic block. Remember one of the things which I always tell, any resident who is located with me have always heard, all patients with neuropraxic block have demyelination, but not all demyelination have neuropraxic block. So, to get neuropractic block, you should have complete loss of myelin in two internal areas. If there's no complete loss of myelin in two internodes, you're not going to have conduction block, uh, neuropractic block. Neuropractic block is just basically the axon is intact, just the myelin is completely lost in two internodal areas. And that may not happen all the time. You might have some loss of myelin, but not necessarily all loss, and it's not in subsequent. So then you would not have conduction block or neuropraxic block. So temporal dispersion is generally absent in hereditary neuropathies despite slow conduction velocity. Say in Charcot-Marie tooth disease, uh, which is a uniformly demyelinating pathology, it's not a segmentally demyelinating pathology. That means every part of the axon has lost the conduction. All of your responses are pushed out in similar latency, so you would have no dispersion of the response. On the other hand, in segmental demyelination, where there is patchy loss of myelin in different areas, you stimulate the nerve, and the response which arrives at the muscle may arrive at different times, and so there is not going to be summation. And so, and then because they arrive at different times, 
the response is going to be much wider and maybe qualitative. So I'll show you a picture of that. And then uh, the, the other thing is uh, neurotoxins that block sodium channels can cause, such as in, uh, if you eat blowfish, which has streptodotoxin, or if you eat shellfish, which is contaminated with red tide, you get saxitoxin, and you would have uh, slowing of conduction velocity. So, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, I've seen at least two or three patients who come, oh, I went and when I was in Florida, I ate the fish and I developed this tingling in my face and uh, my hand was numb and my feet were numb. And then about three, four days later, I got better, but I still have some tingling. They ate either a contaminated fish or they ate a blowfish. And, and uh, that's what happened probably with them. And then you can look at the conduction velocities and go from there. Temperature affects velocity. So be aware of that. Right? If you have uh, low temperature, the conduction velocity is going to be slow. And that's one of the commonest mistakes which is done by majority of the electrodiagnosticians, thinking that the conduction velocity slowing is related to a pathological process, but really it may be related to conduct slow, low temperature. And they have never recorded the temperature. Back. So here is, a, here is a recording. So the first set of recordings here are of a normal nerve. Okay. So all of the amplitudes were recorded at 5 millivolts per division and 2 millisecond uh, uh, in the time base. So all of them look exactly the same and the amplitudes are very similar. But look at the other side. Okay, this is a, a response distally. This is a patient with segmental demyelination. Look at the duration between this and this. This duration is wider compared to this. And this was at two millisecond, five millivolts. So this is a fairly big response. Now, as you go proximally at the elbow, what happened? The duration became a whole bunch more. So the, the time it took for the nerve to transmit impulse became much more. And it's still at two millisecond and five millivolts. And look at the third response at the uh, at the uh, at the uh, the latency is is longer. And this response was recorded at one millivolt and two millisecond. It's a polyphasic response. It's very very wide duration. Typical of segmental demyelination. As you go with segmental demyelination, you're going to have responses which are much wider polyphasic as you go proximally and smaller in amplitude as well. Now this is from the myasthenic uh, syndrome patient. So if you look at the baseline response, this, the response which is in the bottom is, is a very tiny response. And that is because there is not enough calcium which is being produced within the cell within the uh, end plate zone for release of the acetylcholine. You need calcium to bind to the, the membrane to be releasing the acetylcholine into the uh, neural cleft. So as you give about 10 second exercise, you got, you flush it with calcium. Now all of the acetylcholine is being released. Now the response is going to be much larger. Okay. So that is called facilitation. That facilitation is more than 50%. It could be as much as 600% between baseline and when you get the response. That's a classic thing with uh, Lambert-Eaton myasthenic syndrome. Uh, myasthenic syndrome, okay? And the thing which you look at, well, the point I want to show is also the fact that when they st are stimulated at three per second after doing that 10, uh, 10-second contraction, it behaves exactly like myasthenia gravis. There is a decremental response. One response, second response, third response, and the response is going to be exactly the same as myasthenia gravis. So you want to be very careful if you give a whole bunch of resistance and then try to do the stimulation, you're going to miss the patient with lamps generally. Okay. Uh, right. 
uh, sensory nerve action potential. Snap. Again, amplitude represents density of sensory fibers and not the number of fibers in the nerve. Important point. So how do we know that it represents only the density, not the number of axons? So you can take, for example, record, simulate the median nerve record from the index finger. And the index finger response is going to be whatever amplitude, say 50 microvolts. Okay. You simulate on that side and record from a proper digital nerve. It has 50% of the icons almost, because on that side there's 50% of the icons, this side there's 50% of the icons. But if you record only on the proper digital nerve, the amplitude is going to be very similar. It's not going to be 50% of the icons. So, so that tells you that it is related to the density, not necessarily related to the number of icons. Right? Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a thing which you, you have to think about a little bit. Now, there is a larger drop in progeny of and amplitude. We talked about that already. That's due to phase cancellation. Orthodromic sensory responses are much smaller than the antidromic sensory responses. What is orthodromic and what is antidromic? Orthodromic is the stimulation, the way the nerve is transmitting information. In a motor nerve, orthodromic is stimulating proximally recording distance because that's how the nerve is transmitting that information. In a sensory, orthodromic is stimulating distally and recording proximally because that's how sensory nerves are transmitting information, right? But generally, when we do sensory studies, we don't do orthodromic in our lab. We do antidromic. Occasionally, we do orthodromic, such as in plantar nerves, we do orthodromic. So the orthodromic responses generally are smaller in size compared to the antidromic responses. So hence, we use, as it is, they are smaller responses, we use antidromic uh, stimulation. Um, and then, if your intra-electrode distance is four centimeter, it's, you are going to record all of your amplitude. If it is shorter than four centimeter, both the recording electrode and the reference electrode, you've got two electrodes always. One is recording, one is reference. And it is going to look at the response which has not completed under that yet and start looking at it there. So it's going to cancel out. So the amplitude is going to be smaller and it's going to be narrower. So hence, you have to be careful with keeping the distance at least four centimeters apart between the centimeters. Motors, it doesn't matter, generally. Uh, but you would like to have the motor, when you're recording motor uh, uh, amplitude, you, want, you don't want to have the electrode on the muscle itself. You want to keep it in an isoelectric area. That means there is no electrical activity. So you stimulate the nerve record over the middle of the muscle, but you put it on the thumb or on a tendon. Okay. Or in, say, if you are a large muscle you are doing in the tibialis anterior, you're going to put the recording electro reference electrode on the bone. So that way you are going to get the maximum amplitude. But if you keep it on the muscle itself, the amplitude is going to be small. So you have to be very careful about that. Um, now, the last point is an important point. Sensory responses are normal despite loss of sensation in patients who have got preganglionic pathologies. What are preganglionic pathologies? Anything which is proximal to the dorsal root ganglia is called preganglionic pathology. So if you have dorsal root ganglia, which is at the neural foraminal level, right? You remember your anatomy. That's root ganglia means at the neural foramen level. So if you have a root pathology, you would have loss of sensation, right? Because you have loss of transmission of the sensory stimulus from there to the brain. Your brain does not perceive the sensation, so you have loss of sensation. But if you look at the conduction of that 
and you look at the response, it's going to be normal because the cell body of that axon is actually distal to the area where there was uh, compression for loss of function. So say if you have a spinal cord injury patient, you have loss of sensation. But if you do a conduction study in a spinal cord patient, you would have a normal sensory response. Or same thing, if you have a hemisensory deficit in a hemiplegic patient, you do conduction study, it's going to be still normal sensory response because the cell body is normal. So that's an important point to remember. Okay. Yes. Is that true like 10 years after? Like if you want to this one quotation, the nerve wouldn't actually do like it. It would still be the same. It would because the cell body remains pretty much the same as all this thing. So it doesn't really change whenever you do uh, in the upper motor neuron lesions or and unless unless the you know in, in a in a lower motor neuron lesion, however, in a root lesion, if the compression is so severe uh, that it caused the death of the axon completely, now you might actually lose some of the uh, the uh, the cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. That may be different, but not in the upper motor neuron. Upper motor neuron, I think, you're going to pretty much be the same. So, so, if you have decreased CMAP and normal SNAP, what would be your differential diagnosis? So, you could be preganglionic lesions, we said, as we said, proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, which is anti Horn cell, root pathologies, upper motor neural lesions, all of them would have that. And then postsynaptic lesions, that is, or synaptic lesions. It's myopathy, neuromuscular junctional disease. So you're going to have normal snaps, but decrease CMAPs. Or in a postganglionic lesion, the only place that could happen is if you're pure motor neuropathy, where sensory fibers are not affected at all. So that's a good way to think about if you have somebody who comes and you check the patient out, they have. Uh, normal sensation weakness, that could be mostly either a postsynaptic lesion, postganglionic lesion, such as pure motor neuropathy, or anti horn cell disease. Right? But root pathologies, upper motor neuron lesion, sensation is lost. Okay? Uh, could be. And then if you have a, uh, if you have a, uh, uh, normal sensory response and uh, decreased CMAP with relatively normal strength, relatively normal strength, you got to think about early anti heart cell disease. Look at early myopathies, you know, early root pathologies, and partial root pathologies. So be careful to look at that. You know, your strength examination has to be a lot more critical. It could be four plus four minus, and that might in fact be telling you about something if you don't pay attention to that it may be uh, difficult in terms of making diagnosis sometimes. So, <coughs> you could make a lot of errors in the conduction study, and I see this all the time. <clears throat> it could be anatomic or physiologic factors, EMG machine control factors, recording electrode factors, stimulating electrode factors, surface measurement factors, EMG machine measurement factors, optimal use factors. So there could be a lot of different things which would cause error. So let's look at these for a bit. So what are the physiologic and anatomic variables which would cause problems? So we already talked about newborn. Uh, in prematures, even it could be slower than 50%. You know, newborn is about 50%. But if it is a premature baby, remember it's going to be even slower and in fact, they used to use nerve conduction studies as a guide to see when did these premature babies attain their newborn status, in a sense. You know, because they, they, they used to do that a while ago, not anymore. So they would do nerve conduction, and so it's 50% of the value now. So they are now about where they should be when they were newborn. Right? Um, effect of aging, because there's 
smile slowly and decrease amplitude, increase latency scale. Effect of gender. So women generally have uh, larger amplitude, shorter peak latencies because uh, their skin is thinner, they could be slender, uh, the density of the nerve fibers may be a little bit more, and so you could have uh, larger amplitude in them. Uh, temperature, that's a very important point. We talked about 2 to 2.5 meters per second uh, for uh, uh, conduction velocity, uh, and then 0.2 uh, millisecond latency for Celsius degree. Cool limbs slows down the conduction velocity, increases the latency, duration, and amplitude. A lot of the times, that last piece is missed. Now, when you have a slowing of conduction velocity, increase in latency, increase in duration, you're thinking it decreases in amplitude, but actually it increases in amplitude. What is the reason why they increase in latency, duration, and amplitude with cool temperature. Why would, why should it affect, why should temperature affect the, the duration and amplitude? Anybody? Is there like a lower threshold to depolarize the muscle cells and so you're getting more fibers it has to do with a physiologic factor. How about you guys who are, who are in the lab right now? I think duration is um, basically uh, you're slowing the conduction losses. You have, how you say earlier, with uh, some intermediation. You have the fibers, individual fibers are, there's more variation in the time they get there. So it's a lot of duration. Um, amplitude, I don't know if I can figure out why there's a larger amplitude. Um, okay, those who have completed their rotation, there are three of them back there. So, why do you think there could be increase in amplitude? No, there is dispersion because there's increased duration, right? So, that means there's dispersion. It's because it keeps the sodium potassium channels open for a longer period of time. Right? The temperature affects the sodium potassium channels. Because of that, each one of the action potential which you acquire is wider in duration. So if it is wider in duration, the, they can summate much better. Okay, it is the summation effect of individual action potential which actually increases the amplitude. It increases the duration, increases the amplitude. Both for the same reason, okay? Because each individual action potential is wider than the duration. And, and that's how you're going to have better summation and larger amplitude. So if I see somebody who has got, you know, sensory response which is 100 microvolts and is about Three and a half millisecond in width and duration, I know. Well, did you check the temperature? I'll look at the temperature for the first thing, okay? Because especially when you're looking at very small changes in the latency, so you were looking for a pathological process and your comparison is different, so you have to be very careful. Um, sources of errors in nerve conduction instrument errors, you know, filter settings. Somebody didn't put the filters right. Your amplification was uh, not right. So somebody did this study at 100 microvolts gain when they're doing sensory and the patient had only about five microvolt sensory response. You wouldn't even see it, okay? Uh, your time-based or sweep speed, the latency is 15 milliseconds, but then your time base is 10 milliseconds. So it's outside of the parameter of where you're recording, so you are not gonna be able to see the response. So you will have to be very careful with those. Uh, recording electrode errors, you know, type and size of the electrode, uh, surface versus needle. So a needle electrode, well, would the amplitude be larger or smaller with the needle electrode? 
Why would it be the same? What do you think, guys? I think it'd be one because you think it's closer to the same. Closer to the well, is it now it is larger, I agree. Now that does does that represent usual uh, you know, so you, you have somebody when you do with the surface has a two millivolt response. When do the with the needle, it has fifteen millivolt response. So do you think we are missing something there? Missing something by using the surface as opposed to the needle? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, there's more distance between where you're recording from if the surface is, you know, X amount of millimeters from where. So can you rely on the amplitude when you do needle electrodes? By the way, you're asking that, I'm saying no. But, oh, wow. <laughs> but then, see, this is the problem which happens with multiple child's costs, right? Yes, right? You don't have to give an answer, but you just, oh, that sounds stupid. So I'm going to answer that, right? And you don't have to know a fact. Um, the problem with needle electrode is when you stick a needle into the muscle, you're recording from the muscle fibers were immediately close to it. So if you are right next to the uh, inflate zone and that <coughs> muscle happened to have a 15 millivolt motility potential, it's going to show us 15 millivolt. But it has only one or two uh, motor unit potentials. When you do it from surface, it's going to be a half a millivolt or a millivolt, which is the true response because you're recording from all of the motor unit potentials which are being recorded. But you're not going to record from single motor unit potential with a needle. So needle recording is useless to look at the amplitude data. Needle recording is good to look at latencies and conduction velocities, but not to look at the amplitude. Amplitude data is misleading with the needle. Okay? So you have to be very careful with when you record from the needle. You can record, stimulate from the needle and record <coughs> with a surface electrode, but you can't record in a with a needle to get the amplitude data. It doesn't tell you anything about seam amplitude we talked about when we do the recording from the needle. Right? Um, Again, we talked about the inter-electrode distance already. Electrode placement, we talked about the error in placing. For a contact to skin, you're going to have small response or variable response. So you have to uh, look at that. Um, well, the stimulation electrode error. Stability of holding the stimulating electrode on the nerve. Keep sliding down. Go to a different area. You know, that happens when you're doing superficial peroneal nerve all the time. It's moving down, up. I say, come on, go back up to where you mark, or because it's riding high. So because you're not holding it right. So um, too strong or too little strength of stimulation. If it is too strong, you're stimulating another nerve. What else would happen if too strong of stimulation? Say if you are not going for another nerve. What would happen if it's too strong of a stimulation with the, uh, with the nerve conduction? Would it change any other parameter other than the amplitude and shape which we talked about? Like if it's not stimulating another nerve. Because majority of the places where we stimulate, and, and that would not affect that there anyway. What would happen when you increase the stimulus is it decreases the latency. That means you're stimulating much further down on the nerve than where you're supposed to be stimulating. Remember, it is a current which is flowing from the anode to cathode constantly. It is a, it is a cycle, right? It goes from here to here, it's flowing constantly. So if you increase the stimulus, your point of stimulation is not where you're stimulating, it's further down because it actually keeps increasing in volume or, or, or in the intensity, right? So you have higher amount of intensity, so you're stimulating, you're actually stimulating at a much distal point than what you thought you were stimulating. So you may be stimulating at six centimeters instead of eight centimeters. So what would happen? The latency is gonna be shorter. That's why you always are asked to roll back once you go supra-supra-maximum. 
because your latency is going to change, right? Um, too little strength of stimulation, of course, the latency is going to be longer because you're not stimulating all of the fibers, plus the amplitude is going to be smaller. Um, too little distance between stimulation sites, that would cause error. If you have measurement error, if you're calculating six centimeter, uh, five centimeters instead of six centimeters, it's going to be 20% with the calculation of conduction velocity, right? So you increase the conduction velocity by significant amount or decrease the conduction velocity by significant amount by that. And if you add a centimeter or decrease a centimeter, and that would change the pathology. You know, instead of uh, saying it's 45 meters per second, I'm saying, oh, it's 35 meters per second across the elbow. Now I say, oh, this has an ulnar entrapment neuropathy. Although it may be an error of uh, measurement or with too little uh, distance. or so too much distance, you <coughs> actually dilute the pathology. So instead of taking a 10 centimeter distance, if you do 15 or 20, now you have added a lot of normal nerve across a nerve. So that means you diluted out the pathological process. So that means that would actually make uh, your uh, values less reliable. So you have to use very specific uh, distances in supply. Wrong side of stimulation we already talked about. Cathode anode reversal. What would happen if you if I change Cathode is the active electrode, anode is the proximal or a reference point. So if I change cathode and anode, what would happen? Latency will be longer. There's another effect which the textbooks talk about. It's called anodal block. Uh, anodal block is by, by stimulating distally with the anode, and then cathode is proximal, there is going to be some collision, there's a block of some of the conduction. However, uh, other studies have shown, that was, you know, the, the earlier researchers used to talk about an anodal block, and it doesn't happen. Really. It's just the latency change is what you're going to be worried about, because your distance is going to be two centimeter longer than what you're uh, supposed to be stimulating that. If you have electrolyte bridging, that means if you're sliding your stimulator all over the place, now your anode and cathode are connected, so you're not going to have the differential stimulation, so you're going to have problem with uh, conducting electricity through that area to where you're recording. So it's going to decrease the amount of stimulus. Um, stimulus artifact is when your ground is not well connected so you're going to have a huge dip or huge going up so you are going to have this stimulus artifact which would actually make it difficult for you to do the recording appropriately surface measurement errors we already talked about uh emg machine measurement now that's one of the things which always you have to be careful about because emg machine may put your marker much further down or much proximally because there's all these automatic markers now. So if you rely on that, you're going to have some problem with the uh, interpretation because sometimes it may be putting where the machine thinks it is the appropriate area and when you go back and look at it, it's really not. It changes that all the time. So be aware of that. Um, optimal use errors, you know. Uh, not performing both motor and sensory conduction studies because sensory conduction studies will give you a bunch of information which is uh, not provided by the motor or not assessing recording critical NCS data such as amplitude. A lot of people, you know, if you look at the uh, EMG reports, you'll see so many kind of uh, errors in terms of uh, uh, doing appropriate conduction studies and, you know, they interpret that based on, uh, based on, uh, these errors, uh, you know, it's terrible. Um, not performing pertinent conduction studies. So if you have a shoulder weakness, but if you do median and ulnar, it's not going to tell you anything about shoulder weakness. You got to do appropriate conduction studies. Uh, you have to select appropriate. Not utilizing side-to-side -side comparison. Not piloting no conduction studies in needle studies. 
So if you have uh, normal amplitude, uh, the EMG uh, you do has uh, you know loss of uh, uh, significant loss of the motor unit potential. So you you're you're worry whether uh, your gain was right and whether you had appropriate recording or were you really looking at some kind of an artifact. You got, or vice versa. So you have normal strength and EMG was normal and your amplitude is only two millivolts or one millivolt, where it should be five or six millivolts. So go back and really look at what, what was the problem. Um, um, not comparing the NCS results in the same limb, you know, sometimes that would help in terms of, say if you look at the recording from the tongue, Say sensory response from here is from the median, from here is the radio. So if you have carpal tunnel syndrome, this would be affected, this would not be affected. Right? Or if you look here, there is ulnar on one side, median on the other side, so you could compare that. Or say the amplitude of the uh, median was 5 millivolts, amplitude from the ulnar is 15 millivolts. Okay? It's the same, same limb, so you are looking at a higher end of amplitude here, here you're looking at lower end, that doesn't jive right, so there has to be some pathology here, or technical issue. So you want to go back and re look at that. If there's pathology, then you'll have to be able to define. So if it is, if this is in mid-range, this will be in mid-range. If this is in the low range, this will be low, low range if it's normal, right? And this is in high range, this will be in high range. But if this is in high range, this is in low range, then there has to be pathological problem. Um, not doing needle studies with the muscles recorded uh, from during the motor conduction. So if you have an amplitude which is very small from uh, EDB, let's say, and, but then everything else is normal, if you don't look at the EMG of the EDB itself, that would not tell you why there was smaller amplitude in the EDB. So you'll have to be able to explain that. So you'll have to go back and really look at that EDB uh, study. I think we had a patient like that. Uh, was seen patient of Dr. Van Vy where we had to do the EDB to find the pathology. There was nothing proximal. Uh, if you remember uh, the young lady with high heels, six inch heels or eight inch heels. <laughs> With the heels. All right. So, if you do routine assessment of the nerve conduction study, you really are looking at mostly lower part of the part, lower trunk, medial part. So, the median nerve conduction study is this. You see, this is uh, this is CAT1. You're recording from the abductor pollicis brevis, which is CAT1 muscle. So you are looking at these fibers. And the ulnar is looking at the CAT1 fibers. And then the sensory is looking at the C8 fibers. Only thing you are looking at the C6 fibers is by looking at the median sensory. So you're really, if you do routine studies, you are not looking at anything from the upper or middle trunk, C5, C6, C7, you're looking at only C8, T1. So you have to actually do an appropriate study to evaluate those things, right? All right, that's for the nerve conduction studies. You wanna to go to the EMG piece? For another 10 minutes, well, let's run through very quickly. Um, so, Multiple muscles are accessible, for example, you use a needle electrode, combination of muscles are tested based on the clinical question. You know, you don't select muscles, not based on the clinical question. Level of discomfort is marked. I've had it done on myself hundreds of times, it's not that bad. You just have to explain. Now, I see one of the things people always tell the residents when they explain <coughs> Uh, the study to the patient. So we're going to shock you. We're going to stick you. We're using a, a, a needle. So what you are doing is you're already creating psychological terror. So 
you have to be very careful of using your language. You have to use softer language. I'm going to do electrical stimulation, but I'm not going to shock you. Electrical stimulation seems softer. Okay. And I explain what the electrical stimulation is going to be. You walk on the carpet, touch the doorknob, you're going to feel this electrical stimulation. That's how it's going to feel like. A lot of people have felt it. So it doesn't create terror. What do you mean you're going to shock me and stick me? Be careful. You don't use the word needle, you use the word pin. Pin is softer than needle. It's exactly the same thing, but it's softer. Right? You always use a pin to record and you listen into the muscle. So when you explain it that way, you are not going to create terror in the patient's mind. So, and then you can be able to get farther ahead, get things done. It is an uncomfortable test. It's not an unbearable test, but you have to explain that appropriately. Um, so you do a sequence of things. You are going to do insertional activity. You stick the needle in, and then you're going to see the amount of activity. Then you are looking at spontaneous activity, which is at rest. And then you look at the motor unit potential amplitude with minimal contraction, and you look at the interference pattern of recruitment pattern with maximal contraction. So you're going to look at all of those things, right? Uh, in during the study. Um, so insertional is burst of electrical activity as the needle inserted into the muscle due to disruption of the muscle fiber membrane. So you're going to actually when you disrupt the muscle membrane. Potassium is going to come out, sodium is going to go in, so you're going to have electrical activity. And prolonged, it's prolonged with denervation and so in some muscle diseases. Abnormal spontaneous activity, you see fibrillation, sparse deviations, fasciculations. It's hallmark of loss of axons and also some muscle diseases. In muscle diseases, why would I get fibrillations and sparse deviations? There's no axon loss, right? So it's because the loss of connection between the end plate zone where the nerve is entering the muscle and the piece of muscle fiber, which is not connected to that because of say, either a vacuole, huge vacuole, such as in muscular dystrophy, or maybe in polymyositis, there is actually, uh, <clears throat> there is you know, disruption of the muscle itself, which is actually lost the connection and that part of the muscle is gonna be fibrillating. Insertional activity is normal if it is less than 500 milliseconds. And mostly if the spike form increase more than 500 milliseconds, both spike and positive waveform could be seen as a normal variant in, in um, sometimes in patients with uh, so-called uh, uh, EMG disease, you know, uh, which uh, Ernie Johnson described and in normal, perfectly normal strength and everything else you get fibrillations, uh, positive waves, and increased insertional activity. And every muscle you stick into, you would have exactly the same thing in those patients. So if you see something like that, then you know, you know this is a normal variant. It's not due to, I've seen maybe five patients like that. Uh, but it's there. So you have to be very careful. Look at the other data to see if it is truly pathological problem. Um, if it is uh, less than 300 milliseconds or absent, it is decreased, and you could be seen in when you when you are not in the muscle, it's going to be decreased. You know, if you are in fat or in fibrotic muscle, or when there is uh, periodic paralysis, you know, in potassium depletion. So you're going to have uh, decreased uh, insertion activity. So these are fibrillations and fasting waves. They have similar etiology. You know, either. Uh, Axon loss process, denervation, uh, muscle fiber uh, uh, is uh, separated out from the uh, nerve. Fibrillations are extracellular and positive waves are intracellular. So remember, if you're extracellular, you're going to have the electrical activity come close to your recording area. And as it's under the needle, it's going to go up and it's going to go opposite direction as it's moving away from it and comes back to baseline. So it's a spike form. Positive wave form, on the other hand, you stick the needle in, it's intracellular, you're gonna have the electrical activity comes in, and then there is a sudden change in direction, goes down, and then you have 
the sodium takes a long time to get out of the cell, so you're going to have a long duration uh, wave uh, uh, instead of uh, you know very narrow uh, thing. Here you see this has a very wide duration thing. This is a uh, um, uh, so that's a classic path wave, and so. Now, usually they are regular, but you could have irregular filing, so be aware. So, pitfalls to avoid interpreting increased insertion activity as runs of fibrillations or fast delays. Interpreting single area fibrillations as abnormal, you know, see that sometimes. Interpreting occasional fibrillations in foot muscles as strongly supportive of a pathological process because an occasional fibrillation may be present. Uh, in about 3% of the population in, um, in foot muscles. Uh, interpreting biphasic inflation. So if you're in the end plate zone, you are going to see uh, a baseline hum, and then any transmitted uh, responses are going to have uh, a spike form. So end plate potentials uh, are, uh, are interpreted as fibrillation sometimes. And interpreting electric electrical artifacts as abnormal uh, uh, spontaneous activity, and equating fibrillations with acute denervation. They may have no acute denervation, but there may be fibrillations, such as in muscle disease. There's no axon loss there, so that's why I don't like to use the word denervation potentials because they are not same, because it could be due to muscle disease as well. Um, now, how do you differentiate between end plate spikes and fibrillations? That's an important thing to think about. Those who have done the EMG rotation can tell me that. How do you differentiate between end plate spike? Hmm? Well, but repositioning the needle, everything goes away, even fibrillation goes away. Yeah. It's irregular. But we said sometimes the fibrillation could be regular. Waveform is exactly the same. It's spike form, right? No. So, so you look at two different characteristics. I agree, regular. Generally, the fibrillations are regular, but could be regular. However, the rate of firing, rate of firing is very fast in end plate spikes, number one. Number two, it is always associated with the seashell noise. In fibrillations, you don't have that. Number three, the initial deflection in a fibrillation is always positive. Positive in electrodiagnostic term is down. In end plate spike, it's always negative. Okay, so although they're similar looking, you would have some differences. So you have to be very careful in terms of different, because it's, I've seen people, oh, we saw fibrillations, and you guys show me, and I, no fibrillations. So the only thing what they've seen is end plate spike. So you have to be, you know, be careful in terms of interpreting something which is normal as abnormal, right? So it's a fasciculation. Fasciculations are exactly the same as motor unit potential. Fasciculations are judged by the company it keeps. If your company is bad, it's bad fasciculation. If company is good, it's benign fasciculation, such as when you drink too much coffee, you start getting fasciculation in the eye. Uh, you, if you are excited, then if you are, uh, if you are going to the exam, you're nervous, you're gonna get the fasciculation. You know, it's very common to get benign fasciculations. Uh, if your mouth starts twi twitching and you know, you're sitting in front of the examiner uh, for the, for the uh, World boards, you might start having all these reactions. So, but that's normal. That's fasciculation as well. Okay, so be aware. You know, fasciculations are always judged by the company it keeps. You know, third-year medical student disease is anterohansel disease, right? I've got fasciculations all over the place. So I think I'm, I got a, you know, ALS <laughs> because you're thinking fasciculations are always associated with, with pathology. Not true, right? They're single firing motor unit potentials, and you cannot 
fire your motor unit potentials voluntarily only one time. That's a classic thing. So that they sound like popcorn, you know, pop, 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 pop. So you, you're gonna feel, you're gonna hear that way. And, and uh, you know, frequency varies from one hertz for many per minute. Usually, generally, the faster firing ones are all almost always benign. What units, you know, uh, you look at the amplitude, duration, morphology. Um, it increases the activation with increasing volitional uh, activation. Uh, motor unit pattern with full valence activation is interference pattern, right? Um, so when you look at motor unit potentials, if it has added muscle fibers, such as in denervation and re you're going to have increased amplitude and duration. And there's going to be increased polyphasicity. That means it's not going to be biphasic, triphasic. It's going to have polyphasic. That means more than five crossings of the baseline. And it's going to, there is temporal dispersion of the terminal nerve branches of the motor unit potential, such as sprouts. That would increase the polyphasic motor unit potential. There's increased duration of the unit, and there's going to be satellite potential. Satellite potentials are the units which are time locked with the actual motor unit potential, and comes to a baseline, and then there is this potential, and it's always time locked, and that's due to a sprout which is going to a um, muscle fiber. And if you have loss of muscle fibers in myopathy or neuromuscular junction, you're going to have decreased amplitude and duration of the units. Um, I think I'm going to run through this very quickly and I'm not going to really talk about everything. It falls to avoid judging normal and abnormal, interpreting large amplitude population as well. That's, uh, you know, the, the third point is very important. So when you have myopathy, you're going to say there are fibrillations and the units are going to be narrow and small. So sometimes fibrillations can be talked about as small unit there. So you have to be very careful with interpretation of that. Um, and, you know, in, in an older person, you know, you're going to have larger, wider uh, motor unit potentials and you can't interpret the same as in a young person because they're going to have larger and wider units. Uh, and not looking at the recruitment is going to be also a problem. Um, reduced recruitment is seen in neuropathy, increased recruitment is in myopathy. So how do we know it's increased? Activation of more motor unit potentials than would be ex expected for the force produced. And or three or more motor unit potentials with barely perceptible contraction. That's increased. Um, Problems to consider before knee EMG, bleeding disorders, anticoagulation, infection, pacemaker, obesity, patients with excessive discomfort. So you, you want to really look at all of those things and address those things up front. Um, limitations, generally not helpful in evaluation, diagnosis of pain from joint disease, fibromyalgia, myofascial pain, central nervous system disorders. And disorders that do not arise from the neuromuscular system. So, you know, clinical exams should tell you these things generally a lot of the time. Uh, so, we already talked about the data from nerve conduction, data from the EMG. And so, what to expect from an EMG report? So, you want to have a clinically and physiologically relevant interpretation and diagnosis, right? Note like you know, localization, severity, acuity of the process should be there. Notation of other diagnoses that are detected or excluded. Explanation of any technical problems. I screwed up. That's okay. You know, I didn't do this right. That's why there's a problem. That's perfectly reasonable to tell. Uh, I didn't, you know, or I can't explain this. Bit. I think it's due to my technical problem in recording. If you, if you, if you explain that, I think that should be fine. Reason for referral should be addressed always. Pertinent information that may affect management is provided, which includes need for reevaluation, attempt need for medical intervention, treatment possibilities, all of that, right? So if you have a cardiac quinone lesion, 
somebody with Karaquina, you just don't do the study and then uh, send the patient home and not call the doctor because that patient is going to be otherwise incontinent on the bladder forever. So you got to make sure that you call the physician, say, hey, this patient, and then transfer the patient over to the emergency room right there. So that's those are the kinds of things you'll have to be aware of. So, pulsar, it is a supplement to and not a replacement for the history and physical exam. If you don't do a good history and physical exam, you're going to get a crappy EMG study. They're often time dependent. Early on, there may not be that many changes, as we talked about. Fibrillations and positive waves takes about three weeks to develop. Okay. Uh, Electrodiagnostic studies are not standardized investigations and are modified by the practitioner as needed. So it's an important thing. So a uh, more experienced a person probably will do a better job. Less experienced a person is not going to think through all the processes. Uh, if it's a technician doing it, they're doing it just rotinated tasks. And that means you are not going to get all the information what you need. And it may be, I've seen people who have absolutely no idea about EMGs doing the studies. And I saw a study the other day. They took 60 cycles, which is a normal ambient thing, and put onset latency, peak latency, and duration, and said this is normal conduction study. There was not even a response. So you have to be really careful. And people do all kinds of shams. They don't even know what they're doing. So you have to be careful. Um, should clarify the etiology of symptoms. Uh, should localize peripheral nervous system lesion, assist in therapy decision making, predict neurological prognosis, and exclude other disorders, right? And so you look at all of these things, which uh, help to separate out different things. So that's the motor unit potential. Motor unit potential, uh, motor unit is the anti horn cell, the root, the plexus, the peripheral nerve, the axon, and the muscle fiber. And the sensory fiber goes into the, uh, the area, goes through the dorsal root uh, to the, uh, to the uh, spinal cord. I think that's about it. Now I think you, you know everything about EMGs. You are going to be ready to come back and start this stuff together. It's going to be, well, you know, it's a tough thing. You know, you got to put things together, a whole bunch of information together. Uh, and remember, anatomy is going to be important, physiology. You start, you're never going to use this damn thing again. You're going to be using it all the time. So that's the key thing you have to remember. You know, you're going to use anatomy so much. You must know where the nerves are coming out, uh, what nerve and what is the branching pattern, what is the first muscle, what is the next muscle, walk through. You must know your plexuses, lumbosacral plexus, brachial plexus. And if you don't know all of that, it's going to be harder. And, and since the examination, doing the appropriate reflex examination. So all of that is going to be a help. But it'll be fun. EMG is going to be a lot of learning, big learning curve. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So we'll see. I'll see you all within the next uh, year, right? Good luck. Thank you.